What follows is a presentation entitled A Beginner's Guide to EMC. The areas I'll be discussing today are EMC issues in the real world, what actually is EMC, EMC standards and legislation, the need for EMC, how EMC problems occur, EMC control measures, and some basics of EMC. And then at the end, there will be a question and answer session. EMC issues in the real world. Going back some years, it was fairly commonplace to have to put up with interference to both official and domestic broadcasts like TV and commercial radio. Operating a hairdryer or drill in the same room or even the same house as an old style CRT television was causing interference to the picture. And although I'm not quite old enough, I'm assured that going back further still, cars driving down the road outside of your house would cause interference to domestic broadcasts. I grew up in Porchester and spent my whole childhood listening to blips from the radar situated on Portsdown Hill on pretty much every device that received a broadcast and had audio capability. However, the problem can be far more serious than some interference to domestic broadcasts. Here's some examples. In Norfolk, various makes of car would go, and I quote, crazy when they passed a particular air defence radar installation, dashboard indicators dropping to zero or maximum, lights blinking on and off, and engines cutting out. Some interference to aeronautical safety systems at a US airport was traced to an electronic cash register operating a mile away, and the instrument panel of a well-known airliner was said to carry the warning, ignore all instrument readings while transmitting HF. Not really acceptable from a safety point of view. So EMC is very much to do with safety as well as the inconvenience of general malfunctions. Even from a broadcast interference point of view, it could be an emergency radio channel that's victim to the interference. So what is EMC? Well, the International Electrotechnical Council, or ISC, defines EMC as the ability of an equipment or system to function satisfactorily in its electromagnetic environment without introducing intolerable electromagnetic disturbances to anything in that environment. The IEC also defines the electromagnetic or EM environment as the EM environment as the totality of electromagnetic EM phenomena existing at a given location. So if we're talking about intolerable disturbances, at a basic level it could be an interruption to public broadcast services like radio or TV. but could also have serious safety implications like, for example, distortion to a radar display, interference to aircraft instrumentation as previously discussed, or even on a large scale, malfunction of a safety monitoring system at a nuclear power station. All electrical and electronic devices generate electromagnetic interference and in turn are susceptible to it. It is the job of the product designer to reduce this generation and susceptibility to acceptable levels. The universal penetration of electronics into industrial, commercial, consumer, military, automotive and medical markets together with the increasing expansion of the radio and spectrum and component and system miniaturization challenge engineers to ensure electromagnetic compatibility for a myriad of interfering electronic products and systems. Failure to do this results in lower quality products that have no chance of success in competitive markets. It may also lead to conflict with government authorities enforcing EMC regulations, as well as effective, affecting product marketing and export chances. EMC is concerned both with ensuring that bona fide users of the radio spectrum are not inconvenienced by operation of another piece of equipment and that the operation of that equipment itself is not affected by external interference. It extends also to low frequency compatibility, particularly with the mains power supply which is shared among many users. On military platforms, it has to ensure that different electronic systems or different parts of the same system will coexist without affecting each other's operation. While equipment has to be immune enough to operate safely, it must in most cases also be immune enough to operate reliably and with good availability. That is, it must be fit for purpose in its intended environment. Right, a brief bit now on EMC legislations and standards. Commercial standards are organised into four main categories. Basic standards. These generally specify test methods and are by definition independent of any particular product. The EN61000-3 the series of low frequency standards are stated to be basic standards but also include limits and are harmonised. The EN61000-4 series specify test methods but are not harmonised. Generic standards. 
These are related to a particular environment, either residential, commercial, and light industrial, or general industrial. They can be used if there's no product family or product specific standard available. Product family. These relate to a particular product family, e.g. information technology, industrial, scientific, and medical. There is a particular significance to EM55011, 55014, and EM55022, in that as well as being product family standards in themselves, and derived from CISPA original documents, they are applied very much more widely and referenced from gen generic and product specific standards. Product specific standards. These relate to a particular type of product, for instance, welding equipment, road traffic signal systems, electricity meters, gas detectors. Although there are many of these, there are also many types of product that are not covered in this way. Also, it is quite common for a product or product specific standard not to cover all EMC phenomena, so that another standard, such as a generic standard, is needed to complete the coverage. EMC is a somewhat arcane discipline, and most members of the general public are unaware of its implications or the detail of how it is achieved. But its failures can often be seen in the problems that are found in the daily operation of electronic products. As a quick example of this, I've got a mate who's got a free view cable box, comes to a halt every time he uses a microwave oven. He gets the screen blocking up and freezing. Broadly, there are three areas of concern that can be identified. Interference to radio reception, interference from radio transmission, and interference from transient and power-related phenomena. The first of these has been subject to regulation in one way or another for many years, starting with controls on electric motor and vehicle ignition noise in the 1930s. As sources of radio noises have multiplied, so has the spread of regulation extended, culminating in the EMC Directive, which was last revised in 2004, and which covers most electrical and electronic apparatus. Individual sectors such as automotive, military and aerospace need to regulate device emissions in a way appropriate to their particular platforms. New issues such as the spread of broadband telecommunications and the use of portable electronic devices by passengers and aircraft are continually challenging the state of the art. The question of immunity is a much more an issue of fitness for purpose and ensuring reliable operation in a given electromagnetic environment which is more or less hostile. This has historically been a matter for contractual agreement, although the EMC Directive has chosen to regulate this area as well. This list summarizes the range of phenomena that fall under the heading of electromagnetic compatibility for commercial equipment. It corresponds to the various phenomena that are covered by standards that are harmonized under the EMC Directive. These phenomena are already the subject of product-specific or generic standards. Any commercial electronic product now has to consider all the items on this list as part of its performance specification. Although RF signals are present in the environment or gener generated by the product at many frequencies, the coupling routes into or out of the equipment vary, and therefore the phenomena are treated separately over different frequency bands for the purpose of testing and regulation. For immunity testing, the test methods are covered in basic standards in the IEC 61000-4 series. These do not themselves have mandatory force, but are, ref are referred in the product and generic standards, which do. For LF power disturbances, mains harmonics and flicker, both the test methods and limits are called up in mandatory basic standards, which apply directly to a wide range of equipment. RF emission requirements are contained in CISPA standards, which themselves apply to certain product families. But the test methods and limits are applied more widely through references in other product standards. So by using these specifications and tests, we achieve a route to conformity. Under the latest edition of the EMC Directive, there is one route to conformity named Internal Production Control Leading to Self-Declaration. It covers internal design and production control. This module does not require a notified body to take action, but at the discretion of the manufacturer representative, they may elect to follow the notified body procedure in Annex 3. The notified body function effectively replaces the competent body, fu body function under the old EMC directives, but now the use of a notified body is optional. Under the old directive, the use of a competent body was mandatory when using the old technical construction file route to conformity. Although the TCS technical construction file route is no longer valid, all manufacturers must now create technical documentation and perform an EMC assessment. 
The technical documentation is therefore similar in function to the old technical construction file. In order to remove trading barriers within the EU and between EU members, transposed harmonised test standards are used, which essentially means that a test in the UK to BSEM 55011 should be the exact same test as one carried out to DIN EN 55011, a German test standard. In the same vein, the CB scheme encourages member states worldwide to bring their standards into line with the international IEC standards, which the EN standards are harmonised with. And where the state standards cannot be completely harmonised, additional technical documentation is provided which clearly outlines where requirements differ. In short, it's a scheme to harmonise EMC standards worldwide. So now that we've had a brief look at legislation and the route to conformity, let's discuss how EMC problems occur. Essentially, EMC problems can occur from two basic sources, intentional radiators and unintentional radiators. In other words, EMC problems can stem from a deliberately transmitted source, radio or communication transmissions, radar or mobile phones, for example, or an accidentally transmitted source, i.e. a piece of kit that has no intentional transmission function, but through its design, unintentionally transmits RF. Here's some examples of intentional radiators. Firstly, we have radio and TV broadcast transmitters, civilian military radars, and these can be both fixed and mobile. We also have equipment that needs to generate a frequency as part of its operation, plastic welders, induction furnaces, microwave ovens, and dryers. And we have localized communication devices, cell phones, walkie-talkies, and wireless LANs. These are all intentional radiators in that by their intended operation, they will emit RF. To calculate the immunity requirement for a piece of equipment, or how we can ensure that a piece of equipment will work at a given distance from an intentional radiator, we need to know how strong a field a typical intentional radiator will transmit. Once we know this, tests can be used to ensure that RF fields from intentional radiators won't affect the operation of the equipment. Here we have a table of typical transmitters and field strength at given distances. For example here, we've got a walkie-talkie handset with an RF power of 4 watts. This will generate a 3 volt meter field at a 3.7 meter distance and a 10 volt meter field at 1.1 meters distance. The figures in this table do assume that we are both transmitting and receiving in free space. Once we add constructive reflections, either by using antennas with mounted reflectors or with incidental constructive reflections from co-located structures, the distance for those field strengths will decrease. Now we've got some examples of unintentional radiators. Everything which uses electricity or electronics always leaks and so emits some EM disturbances. The higher the rate of change of voltage or current, the worse the emissions tend to be. Power and signals in devices, printed circuit board traces, wires and cables also leak EM waves. And shielding enclosures leak EM waves from apertures, gaps and joints. From that, we can draw that the EMC issues from unintentional radiators are just as relevant as the issues from intentional ones. EMC testing has evolved to include tests which cover all expected eventualities. Let's have a look at some of them. Most electrical and electronic equipment is connected to the outside world via cables to carry power or signals. As long, thin metal structures, these are efficient at coupling electromagnetic energy into or from the environment. Imagining the equipment as a black box, its internal electrical operation creates disturbance currents at the cable ports which are carried out along the length of the cable and either develop radiated fields or pass to other equipment connected to the same cable. These currents can be wanted signals on the cable but they may also be unintended signals which couple out in common mode even on DC power lines or cable screens. The reverse also happens, that is, external disturbances induce currents on cables that then pass into the equipment via its interfaces and cause interference to the internal operation. Consequently, testing the cables is an important part of the total EMC test procedure. The counterpart to coupling via cables is coupling via the product enclosure. Here, the fields interact directly with the conducting structures inside the enclosure, wires, PCB tracks, and even the components themselves. 
The extent of the interaction is determined by the geometry and size of the conductors, with long or widely separated tracks and wires coupling greater amounts of energy into or out of the system. A shielded enclosure reduces this interaction, but no shield is perfect, and gaps or apertures in the conductive surface of the shield will allow fields to penetrate in both directions, coupling with the whole of the contents of the enclosure, but particularly with structures close to the gap. Enclosures coupling, enclosure coupling predominates at frequencies whose wavelengths are comparable to the enclosure's dimensions, and ne necessitates radiated as well as conducted testing. Electrical fast transient bursts test subjects. Uh, the electrical fast transient burst test subjects, the EUT, to bursts of transient that test its immunity to environmental disturbances caused mainly by local power switching operations. The transients are called fast to distinguish them from lower frequency surges caused by distant disturbances outside the immediate environment. When a current carrying circuit is interrupted by an unsuppressed air gap switch, such as a contactor or relay, the resultant voltage rise across the gap causes a repetitive ignition and extension of an arc discharge, the so-called showering arc effect. The nature of the arc is determined by the magnitude of interruption current, the circuit and load inductance and stray capacitance, and the rate of separation of the contacts. It generally results in a burst of fast, low-energy current transients which couple along the supply circuit or are radiated from the conductors on either side of the switch. The burst repetition rate varies from 10 kHz to 1 MHz. The supply wiring appears as a transmission line so that the line characteristic impedance determines the transient source impedance, and the transients themselves are easily attenuated by distance. As a result, these fast switching transients are only a threat to local susceptible equipment, but the digital equipment in particular may easily be upset by them. The surge test applies high energy but relatively low bandwidth transients, particularly representing those that may be attributable to nearby lightning strikes. Lightning can couple to power and other external lines in any of three generic ways. Direct, by a strike to an overhead or exposed line, Indirect, via, couple, by, via ground coupling, lightning strikes the ground, causing a transient potential gradient which is applied to cables that are ground referenced, or indirect from cloud to cloud strikes, magnetic and electric fields induce surges in cables on or near the ground. The duration of a typical direct strike which creates both electric or E fields and magnetic or H fields, as well as current and voltage surges, is in the order of tens of microseconds with an initial rise time of a microsecond or so. The peak channel current is measured in tens or hundreds of kiloamps. So a direct strike could be 100,000 amps with a one microsecond rise time. For indirect strike, this is usually a lot lower, typically about 80 volts peak to peak. The ESD immunity test is intended to simulate the threat from a nearby or direct discharge from a charged person. It does not represent other sources such as furniture or vehicles, which are also a common source of ESD. When movement occurs between two surfaces, the triboelectric effect causes a separation of charge between them, and this in turn causes an electric potential to build up on each surface, and by extension on the body beneath that surface. This charge will then be equalised when the body approaches and touches another object, whether or not it is grounded. If the object is electronic apparatus, the resulting discharge current can cause malfunction in the apparatus and even damage to sensitive electronic components. The severity level offered in testing of IEC 61000-4-2 represent four categories of environment, depending on their likely minimum relative humidity and the presence or absence of static generative materials. We have level one, which is a 35% minimum relative humidity, with anti-static control and a 2 kV contact to air discharge, going right up to level 4, which is 10% relative humidity, synthetic rich environment, 8 kV contact and 15 kV air discharge. Low frequency power supply compatibility is also regarded as an EMC phenomenon. Disturbances of the supply voltage itself, sometimes known as power quality or PQ, are of course varied. The standard tests simply specifies some standard dips and interruptions on the main supply, 
in order to give repeatable and universal testing. Dips and interruptions are abrupt changes. The standard also offers an optional test against voltage variations with a defined transition period, but these are rarely used by product committees. The voltage dips interrupts test is applied to the main supply input and usually uses a programmable waveform generator. It may also use a switched variac on the local mains if the supply has sufficient capability. The basic parameters are interruptions to 0% voltage from half a cycle to 50 cycles. So that would be a dip down to zero volts for between one half of a power cycle, so one half of a 50th of a second, right up to one second, 50 cycles of the power. And dips to four, from 40 to 70% of the nominal voltage from half a cycle to 50 cycles again. So that's dipping down to 40% of the normal power supply or 70% of the power supply. Testing with a steady magnetic field may apply to all types of equipment intended for mains distribution networks or for electrical installations. Testing with a short duration magnetic field related to fault conditions requires higher test levels than those for steady state conditions. The highest values apply mainly to equipment to be installed in exposed areas of electrical plants. Magnetic fields at power frequencies are common in the environment, but are only a threat to certain types of equipment. The commercial magnetic field immunity test method requires the UT to be get your words out. The commercial magnetic field immunity test method requires the EUT to be immersed in a magnetic field of 50 Hz or 60 Hz sinusoidal generated by an induction loop surrounding it in three orthogonal orientations. By contrast, the military magnetic field immunity test of DEFSTAN 5941 or 411 DRS01 applies a spot field from a small loop located close, 5 cm, to the EUT, over the range 20 Hz to 50 kHz. The levels of typically 140 dB picoteslas, which equates to 10 microteslas, or 8 amps per meter up to 4 kHz, applied in this test have been derived from extensive measurements taken within the confines of ships, aircraft, and military land vehicles. Coupling mechanisms. Putting source and victim together shows the potential interference routes that exist from one to the other. These can be identified as one, conducted through a direct connection from one to the other, two, near field induced by proximity of structures such as cables which have significant mutual capacitance or inductance, or three, far field radiated, where the structures behave as receiving or transmitting antennas. When systems are being built, it is necessary to know the emission signature and susceptibility of the component equipment to determine whether problems are likely to be experienced with close coupling. Adherence to published emission and immunity standards does not guarantee freedom from system EMC problems, but the IEC standard IEC 61000-5-2 is a helpful source of guidance on mitigation techniques and in, in installations. In practical situations, Intrasystem and external coupling between equipment is modified by the presence of screening and dielectric materials and by the layout and proximity of interfering and victim equipment and especially their respective cables. Ground or screening planes may enhance an interference signal by reflection or attenuate it by absorption. Cable to cable coupling can be either capacitive or inductive and depends on orientation, length and proximity to other materials. Dielectric materials may also reduce the field by absorption. Each component has a complex frequency dependent behavior and may include or introduce harmonic and intermodulation components due to non-sinusoidal waveforms and non-linearities. So before we go into some heavier stuff, let's have a look at a typical EMC problem from a commercial aspect. A major manufacturer of automotive parts commissioned a series of robotic paint booths. Paint booths? Paint booths. To save cost, it was agreed that the cabling would be installed by contractors. So this is a large piece of equipment with both movement and solvent spraying. From a safety point of view, we don't want the robot moving when it shouldn't be, and we also don't want it spraying solvent when it shouldn't be. The paint booths suffered random and sometimes dangerous faults. 80% of the shielded cables had to be replaced this time using correct shield termination. But after an EMC investigation, 80% of the shielded cables needed replacing. 
The supplier had not provided any instructions on the correct termination of the screened cables, so after protracted legal arguments, he picked up the bill for the modifications and also had to pay the penalty clauses in the contract. So that's just a very basic example of a typical EMC issue in the commercial environment. So let's take a look at some EMC control measures. EMC control can be applied at three levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Control at the primary level involves circuit design measures such as decoupling, balanced configurations, bandwidth, and speed limitation, and also board layer and grounding. For some low performance circuits, and especially those which have no con connecting cables, such measures may be sufficient in themselves. At the secondary level, the interference between the internal circuitry and external cables is invariably a major route for interference in both directions, and for some products, particularly where the circuit design has been frozen, all the control may have to be applied by filtering at these interfaces. Choice and mounting of connectors forms an important part of this exercise. Full shielding, the tertiary level, is an expensive choice to make and should only be chosen when all other measures have been applied. But since it is difficult to predict the effectiveness of primary measures in advance, it is wise to allow for the possibility of being forced to shield the enclosure. At the system or installation level, further measures can be taken. These include cable routing and segregation, as well as the implementation of system-wide grounding and bonding. An example of layered EMC mitigation using shielding and filtering. So we have a cable going into an equipment rack enclosure. We have filtering on the cable and shielding provided by the rack cabinet enclosure. We then have the chassis of the rack unit. The cable passes into this through a second filter and also the chassis itself will provide shielding. And finally we have the circuit itself with filtering again on the cable and the shielded enclosure around it. Cutting holes in enclosures. A single shielded filtered enclosure could easily achieve suppression of 80 dB at 900 MHz and is an easy item to purchase from numerous suppliers. But cutting a single hole just 15 mm in diameter, e.g. to add an indicator lamp, would reduce it to 20 dB at 900 MHz. So the initial container can provide strong shielding. However, shielding is very easily compromised by cutting holes in it to run cables, pipes, lamps, and other items through the enclosure outer skin. Further compromise can be caused by incorrect termination of cables, even through an EMC gland if not utilized correctly. So let's discuss some basics of EMC. Current management. Current management can be viewed as two complementary approaches. Firstly, to improve immunity, managing unwanted or interfering currents caused by external RF coupling into cables and enclosures, ESD events on cables and enclosures, and surge and fast transient events coupling into cables. System solutions are a low impedance grounding scheme, a low transfer impedance cable screen, properly terminated, a low impedance enclosure construction. Secondly, to manage wanted currents due to the circuit operation, to improve control of RF emissions by using balanced circuit configurations, keeping circuit loop areas as small as possible, minimizing DI and over DT and DV over DT by using the slowest switching or clock speeds that will do the job, controlling stray and intentional capacitive coupling between the circuit and the enclosure, and maintaining a low impedance circuit grounding scheme. Now I've mentioned capacitance there, so we'll just have a brief discussion on capacitance. Capacitance is a property of two conducting structures separated by a dielectric. The dielectric is characterized by its permittivity, which may be a complex quantity. It is expressed in units of farads per meter and determines the capacitance of two surfaces separated by a dielectric. The permittivity represents displacement current, which is 90 degrees out of phase with the applied voltage, and therefore is associated with the energy storage rather than energy loss. The impedance due to the capacitance and measured across the plates of a capacitor is frequency dependent and again complex. It's important to know at a basic level that any two conducting structures, for instance a metal chassis and the ground plane of a PCB, or two parts of a metal metallic enclosure, can exhibit capacitance between them. This is known as stray capacitance. 
since it is not an intentional property, but it nevertheless has measurable effects, especially at high frequencies, where even fractions of a picofarad can be significant. I'll also uh, mention inductance briefly. Inductance is a property of a conductor carrying a current. Even a single length of wire has inductance, and as a result of the energy transfer associated with the magnetic field around the wire. Coiling the wire increases the inductance approximately in proportion to the square of the number of turns. The geometry of the coil also having an effect. Inserting a permeable material, for example iron or ferrite, into the path of the magnetic flux concentrates the field and increases the inductance in proportion to the relative permeability of the material. For example, air has a relative permeability of 1, magnetic materials have magnetic permeability typically in the range of 100 to 10,000. The resulting inductor has a complex impedance which increases with frequency. A change in current through the inductor induces a voltage proportional to the rate of change of current. So again, to sum up, all conductors will have some inductance, which will cause an impedance dependent on frequency. And any two conductors separated by a dielectric can have capacitance, again, which will again have a varying impedance depending on frequency. Bonding. When it comes to bonding, there is no better way than metal-to-metal -metal contact. However, when this isn't practical, then bonding conductors are an option. Using long wire for low frequency, a typical, um, typical of a safety bond on a cabinet, panel or door. But it may need to be longer than is strictly required due to the opening and closing of the panel or the door. Shortest possible for high frequency. Not practical if fitted to cabinet panels or doors. The short wide brace strap is most effective below 3 MHz, and the short wide metal plate with multiple bond fixing bonding points for higher frequency. Avoid multiple bonding where possible. You would think that the more bonding straps you have, the better the ground connection would be. However, ground loops can easily be made which will have current flowing through them. An example of this would be a cabinet door which has a safety ground cable attached to the top of the door and an RF ground strap at the bottom. A ground loop is created which will induce current flow and cause unwanted emissions from the very current you are trying to get rid of. Considering ground as a current path leads to a discussion of different applications of grounding schemes. These diag the diagram shows three possible options. The daisy chain system is undesirable because ground currents from one subsystem share a common impedance with the others. A single point scheme obviates this problem. All subsystem ground returns are, separate, are separately tied to a single point within the system. Its disadvantage is that each return has its own impedance, which in a distributed system may be large due to the separation distances involved. Large impedances mean that at high frequencies, ground differentials exist between the subsystems, whether these are due to signal currents or interference currents. In a multiple point grounding scheme, a large area of conductor, typically a ground plane or chassis structure, serves as the return, and individual subsystems grounds are connected to it at various points. This scheme differs from the daisy chain approach in ensuring that the ground network has a very low impedance between any two points at the frequency of interest. If this is not the case, then a true multipoint system is not realised. Its disadvantage is that widely disparate current levels from different subsystems may still create common impedance coupling problems. The ground structure must be properly designed as an integrated part of the whole system and it may still be necessary to implement single point grounding in particularly sensitive sections, with greater attention then paid to the HF performance of that section. For EMC purposes, we make a distinction between differential mode coupling and common mode coupling. In all situations, there is a structure which is defined only by the desired signal or power circuit. It consists of the signal or power source, its load, and the PCB tracks or cable conductors which carry the current from one to the other and back again. This is the differential mode. This is also known in some situations, particularly telecommunications, as a symmetrical or transverse mode. In general, all of these components are under the control of the product designer. Both their mechanical and, both their mechanical and electrical layers are specified. In principle, we can calculate the conductive or field coupling due to this circuit and control it by appropriate geometry, i.e. proximity of signal and return, and or by filtering. 
Disturbances may be induced in the differential circuit by external interference, immunity issues, or vice versa, emission issues. But in both cases, reduction of the coupling is fairly easy to achieve by design once the relevant paths are understood. Differential mode coupling to and from the cable is mostly affected by the loop area of the total circuit that is carried by the cable. If signal, if signal go and return conductors are widely separated, then the area they enclose is large. An undesirable magnetic coupling within this area is also large. Clearly, if the go and return conductors were to be carried in different cables, then the area would be both large and uncontrolled. Running pairs of conductors adjacent running pairs of conductors in adjacent in the same cable is really the minimum that should be considered. The loop area is then given by the unavoidable separation between them due to insulation times the cable length. The optimum means of minimizing differential mode magnetic coupling is to twist the pair of conductors together. Twisting reduces the effective magnetic loop area, area to almost zero. Each half twist reverses the direction of induction so that two successive half twists cancel the wires interaction with the field. The loop, pick, the loop pickup that remains is now reduced to the small areas at each end of the pair, plus some residual interaction due to non-uniformity of the field and twist irregularity. If the termination area is included in the field, the number of twists per unit length is unimportant. If the field is localized along the cable, as is most usual for near-field coupling, performance improves as the number of twists per unit length increase. Interpair magnetic cross torque is reduced by randomizing the twist rate or twisting adjacent pairs in the opposite sense. The same structure as before also supports common mode circuit, sometimes known as asymmetrical or longitudinal. In this case, the previously described differential mode path is only part of the overall circuit. The common mode path includes the intended circuit, but it also includes the rest of the local conducting structure which is usually but not always earthed or grounded, that is coupled to it either intentionally or by stray coupling. Common mode current is not in any way designed in to the product, but it is unavoidably created both by external disturbances and by the internal operation of the circuit. In the differential mode part of the circuit, common mode current flows in all conductors in the same direction. Common mode current may be derived from the differential mode circuit operation by imbalances in the stray impedances, but it may also have nothing whatsoever to do with the intended differential mode signals. For instance, noise developed in a high frequency part of the circuit can be coupled in common mode onto power supply conductors, which in differential mode carry only DC. There are two significant problems with common mode coupling. One, in general, the common mode path is not under the total control of the circuit or system designer. Parts of the common mode circuit can be external to the product or system and it often includes unspecified stray reactances. And two, the area enclosed by the common mode path is large leading to more effective and more efficient and effective radiative coupling both into and out of the system. The concept of common mode currents becomes most obvious when we consider how a cable couples with a radiated field. With any given length, the whole cable acts as a receiving antenna. Since all the conductors within the cable are equally exposed to the field, neglecting small variations in geometry due to cable bends and wire separation, they all carry nearly the same currents. The actual current amplitude varies with the frequency and cable length, and also varies along the cable due to phase interactions between the illuminating wave and the induced currents. If the cable is shorter than a quarter wavelength, then the induced current increases linearly the in sorry, I'll start again. If the cable is shorter than a quarter wavelength, then the induced current increases linearly proportional. Now I'm still not making sense here. Hold on. If the cable is shorter than a quarter wavelength, then the induced current increases linearly proportional to frequency. Once the frequency is high enough that the cable is longer than a half wavelength, the current exhibits peaks and nulls along the cable as standing waves develop. Conducted RF and transient immunity tests explicitly induce such common mode currents into the test cables by means of the transducer they use. In these, cables, in these cases, cable resonances are avoided as far as possible so that the induced currents are independent of the cable parameters.
The cable itself is passive, so the induced interference currents have no effect on the wanted signals. But when it is connected to a load circuit, any imbalance in that circuit will create a differential interference voltage as the common mode currents pass through it. This is known as mode conversion. If the cable geometry and circuit electronics are both perfectly balanced, it doesn't happen. But in imperfections or intentional circuit and unbalance will introduce this. Once differential interference voltages have been created in the circuit in this way, they will potentially cause disturbance effects as they interact with the circuit's nonlinearities. To prevent this happening, either you have to minimize the mode conversion in that cable circuit interface, or filter the incoming signal or design the circuit for maximum linearity. The impact of the induced disturbance depends on the response of the victim circuit. In a digital circuit, there will be no effect below a given threshold. But above this, timing irregularities will occur. And at higher levels, spurious logic states will be caused. In an analog circuit with the RF at a higher frequency than the operating bandwidth, nonlinear re rectification in the semiconductors will affect operating bias conditions. In this case, the RF at the semiconductor junctions can and should be filtered with a small RC network to suppress the response without affecting the circuit. So just to briefly go over this again quickly, we can see on the slide there that the common mode current is traveling up to the circuit and is the same on both conductors. However, once the common mode current gets to the circuit, um, we create a voltage where the imbalance occurs. We can see one side of the circuit going straight down to ground, but the other side of the circuit is going through a load. Now this is going to create an imbalance between the two common mode currents, and therefore a differential voltage will be created, and that's how we get common mode to differential mode conversion. In the context of RF emissions, differential mode current is the current which flows in one direction along one cable conductor and in the reverse direction along another. It is normally equal to the signal or power current and doesn't flow on the shield. Common mode current flows equally in the same direction along all conductors in the cable, including the shield if it is present, and may either be related to the signal currents or be due to other noise sources at the cable connection. For the frequency range between 30 megs and 100 megs, where many cable-related problems occur, and for a typical cable length of 1 to 2 meters, the common mode current must be limited to less than 5 microamps in order for the emissions to be within, for example, the standard Class B emissions test for civil emissions testing. It is not intuitively obvious that common mode currents are developed by a correctly operating circuit. Such a circuit, circuit should only create currents in differential mode if it is operating as designed. But because of the non-zero impedances of conductors in the rest of the system, an aggregate noise voltage appears across these conductors as a result of the intended operating currents within the system. The self-inductance of zero-volt conductors, for example, PCB tracks and wires, is the most common culprit here. This noise voltage can be referenced between the interface connection and the external ground if the interface is poorly designed. And it may be unrelated to the expected signal on the interface. For instance, power supply noise can be coupled onto a signal pole, or microprocessor noise can be coupled onto a power pole. It then appears as a driving source for all conductors attached to the interface so that the conductors are subject to an unintended common mode current. This can even be applied to the cable screen if it is improperly connected to a terminal that carries voltage noise. A cable screen can be simply regarded as an extension to the screen of an enclosure. Although a full treatment of cable screens is complicated, it can be reduced to two complementary aspects. How the screening works along the length of the cable and how it can be compromised by incorrect termination to the enclosure. Within the cable itself, both interference currents and signal currents are carried in the screen. But at high frequencies, the skin effect separates the inner and outer surfaces of the screen. This minimizes interaction between the two sources of currents. The existence of screen currents allows, also allows magnetic cancellation of the impinging and radiating fields. The main feature of the screen termination is that it must allow these currents to flow unimpeded from the cable screen into the enclosure screen, into the enclosure shield, sorry, without creating any common mode potential between these two. 
Such a potential would act as a driving source for emissions from the cable screen and completely defeat its purpose. This in turn means that there must be absolutely negligible inductance between the screen and the chassis through the mating connectors. The geometry of the connectors achieves this by ensuring that the connector shells surrounding the inner conductors completely and also make contact between each other, the cable screen and the enclosure all around their circumference. I'll just read that through again. The geometry of the connectors achieves this by ensuring that the connector shells surround the connector shells surround the inner conductors completely and also make contact between each other, the cable screen and the enclosure all around their circumference. Uh, that made slightly better sense. Filtering components, like all others, are imperfect. Inductors have self-capacitance and capacitors have self-inductance. This complicates the equivalent circuit at high frequencies and means that a typical filter using discrete components will start to lose its performance at around 10 to 20 megahertz. The larger the components are physically, the lower the break frequency will be. For capacitors, as the frequency increases beyond capacitor self-resonance, the impedance of the capacitors in the circuit actually rises so that the insertion loss begins to fall. This can be counted by using specially constructed um, special construct this can be counted by using special construction such as feed through for the capacitors. Similarly, inductors have a self-resonance frequency beyond which their impedance starts to fall, which is affected by their form of winding. To obtain good performance at high frequencies, it is important to choose the right components carefully. It is possible to take advantage of the self-resonance effect by deliberately choosing components whose self-resonance fall in a frequency range where particular problems are experienced. For instance, a small surface mount wound inductor of a value in the range of 2 to 5 microhenries can have a self-resonance and hence maximum attenuation from 50 to 100 megahertz, which can be very helpful in controlling cable borne emissions. A very simple, inexpensive and easily filter, easily fitted filter is obtained by slipping a ferrite sleeve around a wire or cable. The effect of the ferrite is to concentrate the magnetic field around the wire and hence to increase its inductance by several hundred times. It involves no circuit redesign and often no mechanical redesign either. It's therefore very popular for retrofit applications. Several manufacturers offer kits which include half ferrites which can be applied to cable looms immediately to check for improvements. If a ferrite is put over a cable which includes both signal and return lines, it will have no effect on the signal because it's in differential mode current. But it will increase the impedance to common mode currents. This is because there is no net magnetic field from the differential mode currents, and hence the ferrite is invisible to them. The effectiveness can be increased by looping the cable several times through the core, or by using several cores in series. The self-capacitance of looped windings limits the effectiveness of this approach at higher frequencies. The impedance of a ferrite core varies with frequency depending on the exact composition of the core material. Suppression ferrites are characterized for the purpose and are different from normal inductor core ferrites. They are deliberately engineered to have more loss, i.e. A, a resistive component to their impedance as the frequency increases. Here's some examples of filtering and suppression devices. Power line and signal line filters provide attenuation to RF interference. Filter size does tend to increase with line current and required attenuation, and therefore finding space to fit larger filters inside the equipment is often a problem. However, filters can be added outboard, ensuring that they are, bond they are properly bonded. Signal line filters are available incorporated into connector sockets, but it is important to separate incoming and outgoing cables to prevent coupling, coupling bypassing the filter. Essentially, filters should be treated as having a dirty side with the interferences and a clean side with the interferences being removed, and the corresponding dirty and clean cables should be kept separated as far as possible to avoid inducing the interference back onto the clean cables. Bulkhead filters are available in the form of small feed-through capacitors. Individual transient suppressors like metal oxide varistors or MOVs and transorbs can be used on incoming and outgoing cables and often these are incorporated into power filters. And as previously discussed, ferrites. Ferrites are very effective but are size to frequency dependent. The lower the frequency to be attenuated, the larger the ferrite needs to be and the more turns cables through the ferrite are required. 
Shielding theory, starting with reflection. Shielding theory can be described in the context of a field incident on a uniform conducting barrier of infinite extent, so that discontinuities such as edges or apertures are neglected, essentially an infinitely stretching wall in free space. When an electromagnetic field impinges on a conductive wall, part is reflected and part is absorbed into the wall. For that part of the wave that is reflected, the degree of reflection depends on the ratio of the impinging wave impedance to the, to the barrier impedance. Because it is a surface effect, the reflectivity is not affected by the wall thickness, which is why very thin barriers can be effective. The barrier impedance depends on conductivity and skin depth, and hence also on frequency. Pure magnetic fields are well matched to the low impedance of the barrier and are little affected, while pure electric fields are high impedance and are mostly reflected. Shielding theory, absorption. That part which is not reflected will induce a current flow in the side of the wall, which reduces in intensity as it penetrates into the wall. The remaining current flow which reaches the far side is then reflected back into the barrier, and the surface current density results in an attenuated transmitted field. The thicker the wall, the greater the attenuation of the current through it to the other side. This absorption loss depends on the number of the skin depths through the wall. The skin depth is an expression of the electromagnetic property which tends to confine AC current flow to the surface of the conductor, becoming less as frequency, conductivity or permeability increases. Fields are attenuated by 8.6 dBs for each skin depth of penetration. As an example, the skin depth of aluminium at 30 megs is, not, is 15, sorry, 0.015 millimeters. Unfortunately, shielding theory for an infinite barrier cannot easily be applied to real world enclosures. This is for a number of reasons. Enclosures are a finite size so that theory which assumes infinite dimensions does not cope with the edges of the barrier. Even by comparison to an ideal conductive Faraday cage, real enclosures have many discontinuities due to shape and construction and because of internal structures. Seams and apertures have a large effect on the shielding performance. The enclosure structure causes resonances which cannot be modelled using simple barrier theory but do have a large effect. Internal components modify the effects of resonance and apertures, already hard to model, and also affect the wave impedance within the enclosure in an unpredictable fashion. If the shield is located in free space, then the incident wave impedance can be modelled, but real situations do not normally equate to free space, and so the incident wave is also unknown. With all these factors affecting real shielding performance, calculating the shielding effectiveness theoretically is largely irrelevant, and simple rules of thumb are used instead to give guidelines to achieve adequate performance. Practical shielding effectiveness is limited by necessity the necessary apertures and discontinuities in the shield, and not by the intrinsic properties of the shielding material. Apertures are needed for ventilation, control axis, and for viewing indicators. These are different theories for determining shielding effectiveness due to apertures. The simplest, shown above, assumes that shielding effectiveness is directly proportional to the ratio of the longest aperture dimension and frequency, with zero shielding effectiveness when wavelength equals two times the aperture diameter. This gives a general rule of thumb that shielding effectiveness for less equals 20 times the log of the wavelength over 2 times the diameter. Thus, the shielding effectiveness increases linearly with the decreasing frequency up to the maximum determined by the barrier material, with a greater degradation for larger apertures. A correction factor can be applied for the aspect ratio with the slot-shaped apertures, as shown in the equation above the graph. Another theory which assumes that small apertures radiate as a combination of electric and ma magnetic dipoles predicts a constant shielding effectiveness degradation with frequency in the near field and a, de de a degradation proportional to frequency squared in the far field. This theory predicts the shielding effectiveness dependence on the cube of the aperture dimension and also on the distance of the measuring point from the aperture. Neither theory accords well with observations, although each is useful in pointing out significant contributory factors. An enclosure or rack can provide an RF barrier to a COTS equipment enabling it to achieve EMC within a defence environment. It is also important to filter power and signal ports. Temporary shielding of equipment or cables to localise an EMC issue can be achieved with something as simple as kitchen foil, as anyone who's had trouble with EMC tests at TUV will know. Copper tape also and knitted mesh. 
Non-conductive enclosures, e.g. plastic, can be treated with conductive paint or conductive surface treatment to provide shielding. Conductive gaskets form part of equipment design and cannot be easily retrofitted at installation level. If conductive gaskets are fitted, they also need periodic replacement and should form part of the maintenance procedures. If shielded optical windows and ventilation panels are used, they require specialised design to ensure bonding at the periphery. Well, that concludes my presentation. Many thanks for listening this afternoon, and I hope that you found it useful. Tips of Product Surface at Titchfield run a number of courses throughout the year, including RF and microwave radiation safety, design for EMC, an EMC directive overview, and EMC compliance of military and avionics equipment. Further details are available on our website and, or can be obtained by contacting Tufts of Product Service, Titchfield by phone or email. On behalf of your presenters today, Andrew, and along with everyone involved with today's webinar, thank you for joining today's event.